So to continue from where we left off in our journey. Previously, the last thing we heard was that news had come in from Old Dar about the Sultana. We were told to go back to the Waking Sands and see what has happened. So let's get right into it. We make our way to the Waking Sands to speak with Rawbarn and the others. He looks better than ever. We hear that prior to her collapse, a shipment of alchemical supplies arrived. It came from Frondale Fontistry. It contained a substance which put the patients in a death-like slumber. It leads to Dulala's claims. The Sultana is alive, just sleeping. We need to find information about this substance, so who better to ask than Nanamo's lady-in-waiting? We have discerned her location, the Silver Bazaar, which is why they asked us to come. They want our aid in the upcoming plan. There may be a battle ahead of us. We agree to help and move for the Silver Bazaar. We confront Nanamo's lady-in-waiting, Mariel, but she denies these claims and tries to leave, but is stopped by Rawbarn. We need to know the truth. However, Dulala brings Lola Rito, and he will explain what happened. He reiterates that Teleji Adeleji had the Katanu Reclamation Bill, and it was a facade to get his hands on Omega. When Nanamo wanted to abdicate the throne, the best answer he found was assassination. Teleji discovered a maid who had claimed to the throne that nobody could deny. He would use her as a puppet and do whatever he wanted. Lola Rita caught wind of this and usurped his scheme. Nanamo lives. The poison was swapped for a sleeping potion by her lady-in-waiting. It seems that even Ilbert was in on it. He had him lie about the assassination to bring out Rawbon's rage. Lola Rita had his claws in the Crystal Braves since they began. It was easy to do so by hiding his own movement of money among the others. He hired Ilbert under the promise to help Alamahigo, but in the end he had to fire him as he wanted Rawbarn executed. Lola Rita has one corpse, one fugitive, and he wants to start anew on a blank slate. They have the means to bring Rawbarn back into Old Dar with all of his charges annulled. He hands us a potion. It will reawake the Sultana if she takes it. He is willing to be taken there as a hostage to prove that it works. Rawbarn doesn't like Lola Rito's motive, but he did save Nanamo's life, so Rawbarn does thank him for that. Dulala reinstates him as the General of the Immortal Flames. Olda will be united under Nanamo Unamo in a new age of prosperity. We all make our way to Olda and wait. We cut to Rawbarn in Nanamo's bedchambers. There she lies on her bed the sleeping Sultana. Rawbarn approaches the bed, takes the vial out of his pocket and administers the potion. Some moments pass, but Nanamo begins to make sounds. Her eyes begin to open. Thank the Twelve, she lives. Rawbarn is elated to see Nanamo alive. We are waiting for their return in the royal chambers. Rawbarn arrives to announce that Nanamo is awake. It seems like she still wants to abdicate the throne, but whatever path she takes, Rawbarn will walk it with her. No matter what, it is the best for the nation. Lola Rita still believes in the status quo. He does not want the throne to be abdicated at such a dire time like this. What does Lola Rita know that we don't? He tells us that the Garleans are working on a new airship, not unlike the one Midgard Soma destroyed some 15 years ago the Agrius. It had its recent maiden flight, and it was a complete success. We need to repair the damage caused by Teleji and move forward to face the Garleans once more, as a one, united, Oldar. Oldar has taken control of its future, and we should do the same. Alfinawad decides to disband the Crystal Braves. There were some that were loyal, but most weren't. He hopes that those that were loyal remain our allies in the battles to come. However, those that aided Ilbert, he hopes that they are hunted down and held accountable for their crimes. He still laments the betrayal, but that betrayal has given him new light. 
With the help of us, he has the inspiration to stand headstrong against any hardship. We will find our missing comrades so he can shine the light of dawn across Eorzea again. Alfinoad, the Crystal Brave Commander is no more. From now on, you will be Alfinoad, proud member of the Scions. He goes to the Rising Stones in person to meet with the stalwart companions of the Crystal Braves who were loyal till the end. Even with the Crystal Braves being disbanded, they will stay loyal no matter what he says. He can take their uniforms and ranks, but the ideals in which the company was founded upon have inspired them and will live on in their hearts. They want to help the Scions and fight the good fight. Even after all that has happened, they are still on our side. Alfinoad is emotional over the overwhelming support of his comrades. He wants us to return to Ishgard and check up on the mana cutter. It is nearly ready, she needs a little more time. Instead, Astinian tells us that we should tell Sir Eimerick of our plan. We speak to Sir Eimerick. Mid conversation, Alfinoad comes in and states that the mana cutters are ready. We are ready to take an attack to Nidhogg's domain. We tell Eimerick of what our original plan was, that we tried to negotiate with the dragons. Even though they fell through, we did learn a lot. We did manage to talk with Freys Velgir, and if we did not slay Nidhogg's mate, Teoman, Nidhogg would have sent the Dravanians into Ishgard. Instead, he decided to hunker down and defend himself, so our journey wasn't for nothing. We will assault the Aerie for the best of Ishgard. Eimerick is motivated to join the fight against Nidhogg, but Astinian doesn't allow him to come. If we fail, he will stay behind and defend these walls. Only he has the authority to orchestrate a city-wide defense. Astinian won't let Alfinoad come either. He can fight, but this one is too far out of his league. It will just be us two Azure Dragoons versus the great Wyrum Nidhogg. We make our way into the Aerie with the help of the Mana Cutter. Out of nowhere, Nidhogg follows behind us. He fires a blast at our Mana Cutter, which knocks us off track. He begins to do the same to Istinian, but uses his own eye against him, which causes him to fall out of the sky for a short time, before announcing that he will melt our flesh. Just before we fall to our death, our Mana Cutter reactivates and we land on a small piece of land. We make our way through the Aerie and arrive at the top. Nidhogg begins to fly straight towards us. Estinian again uses the eye, which knocks him flat. Nidhogg remembers Estinian. His essence claimed him once and it will do so again. Estinian proudly announces that it will end here. They begin to battle each other. Estinian jumps right onto his head. Nidhogg tries to shake him off, but is unable. Estinian plunges his lance right into Nidhogg's eye and plucks it out of his socket. Nidhogg falls towards the ground and his form returns into Aether. Just as Estinian said, his armor turns crimson from Nidhogg's blood. He now has two of Nidhogg's eyes. We begin to have a vision. We are put in our vision world. The crystal of lightning regains its color and begins to shine like it did before. We then have another vision. It depicts a dragoon carrying both of Nidhogg's eyes. How is this possible? Didn't we just see Nidhogg with one eye and we just plucked that final eye? The Dragoon is named Haldrath. He has taken revenge for his father, Thordran, and has taken both of Nidhogg's eyes. The King can now take his rightful place as ruler. They have defeated all the great Wyrams in Dravania, except Hrays Velgir, and he won't leave his cage. With this power, nothing can stand against them. The King decides to abdicate the throne. Ishgard doesn't need a King. The people of Ishgard have such wise men that they will be able to do anything they desire. The last of Thordran's bloodline leaves. All the sins of his people 
will be his own burden to carry for all time. After all this betrayal and blood, what do they have to gain? Was it worth it just to have their king leave? The knights who swore loyalty to the king don't want to take up arms anymore if the king isn't here. They will clean their hands and become merchants. In the end, only four people remain. Durian Dare, Halianart, Desamel, and Four Temps. Each one will take equal control of Ishgard. The throne will remain empty until a new king rises and takes his role. The truth of what happened will die here. We awake from our vision. We tell Astinian of what we saw. It was the culmination of the first battle with Nidhogg. The story passed down is that King Thordrand confronted Nidhogg with a mighty band of knights. In the end, King Thordrand was slain, but his son, Haldrath, killed the great Wyrim and plucked out his eyes. He became the first Azure Dragoon. Those eyes became treasured relics of Ishgard. But we know that story was mostly true, except for one point. The Azure Dragoon carries only one of the eyes which Astinian has in his possession. So where is the second? Whose eye did we just pluck from Nidhogg? Every time we receive answers, we are given more questions. In the end, Estinian gives us the remaining eye. And we leave from the Airy. We fought side by side with Estinian and defeated Nidhogg. We will return to Ishgard and report our victory to Sir Eimerick. But first, Estinian wants to converse with Freys Velgir. There is something missing from the story we are being told and we want to know the whole truth. We collide with Yasail on the way, and ask her to come along to see the culmination of the story. We arrive on the zenith and blow the horn. Hrez Velgir answers the call. We have questions for the dragon. He mentions that he did sense Nidhogg's demise. Estinian figures out that the eye that Nidhogg had was Hrez Velgir's eye. We return his eye back to him. With that, Hrez Velgir is fully restored. We begin to have a vision. In this vision, we see a defeated Nidhogg, who was blinded after the battle with Haldrath, conversing with Hrez Velgir. His blindness costed Radatoska her life and Nidhogg his eyes. Nidhogg asks for Hrez Velgir to surrender an eye to him. If he does that, he will consider it his penance. With just one eye, he will be able to make the people of Ishgard suffer endlessly from generation to generation. Praise Velgi agrees and surrenders his eye to Nidhogg. His vengeance begins now. We awake from that vision. It seems that even Yasail had that vision too. It was Hraes Velgi that gave the power to Nidhogg to allow him to continue his rampage for all of these years. Even knowing full well the suffering he would inflict upon the people. Hrez Velgir snaps back. The peace desired by Shiva was shattered by man. They claimed his brood brother and sister's life. He couldn't sit idly. He tells us to leave. Us being here is nothing but unhappy memories. If it wasn't for Shiva's soothing embrace, he would slay us where we stand. Then he flies away. Estinian's life goal was to slay Nidhogg but he doesn't feel gratified in doing so. Even if it ended the bloody war, his family was killed by Nidhogg. With fury in his heart, he took up the lance. He struck in the name of vengeance. He and Nidhogg were no different. Yasail laments that even innocents have died in the name of her greater good. But the tale remains incomplete. Where is the final eye of Nidhogg? We only have one. Why did he throw all of his army against the walls of Ishgard even though he prolonged the Dragonsong War for as long as he could. Before we can figure out what happened, Estinian is contacted by Sir Eimerick. The heretics seem to be attacking Ishgard directly. He laments that we will be ending the Dragonsong War by spilling the blood of our own. Hraes Velgir seems to be right about man. Yusea wants to join us as she can put an end to this bloodshed. She wants to see if she can convince the heretics to stop fighting. We allow her to come along with us. We cut to see Archbishop Thordran VII surrounded by holy knights. 
they discuss the approaching attack from the heretics. They have already got enough numbers to repel the attack. The unrest from the attack will scare the people into asking for deliverance from this. They want there to be chaos within the city. They want the people to pray for salvation. After enough chaos has been caused, the Holy Knights will defeat them. The rest of the Knights leave, and Laha Brea appears and speaks to Thordran VII, asking if the plans are ready to move forward and that it is time for the Bringer of Light to die. We cut back to the city. The buildings are on fire. The smell of ash lingers in the air. Countless bodies lay strewn across the ground. We see Horshfont. He glances towards Yasail. But he trusts in what we do. We push further into Ishgard and find the heretics. Yasail gets in front of the knights, stating that no more blood must be shed today. She reveals that Nidhogg was slain. The Dragonsong War is no more. The cycle of violence born from the Forefather's treachery is over. Nidhogg's hatred burned, and now his flame is no more. Let that hatred die with him. No one has lost. We will finally have the peace that they fought for. The heretics stand down, as they want to pursue peace. The Temple Knights attempt to seize Yasail, but Horshfont gets in the way. The wounded come first. If the heretics want to pursue peace, then Ishgard will do the same. We report the news of everything we did. They are glad to have Yasail here, even if she is a wanted criminal, as she stopped their advances. We speak the truth, Heres Velgir showed us. Everything Ishgard is, is made up of a fabric of lies. The current houses will be called into question and lose their power. The Lowborn and Highborn could trace their line back to Thordran and the original knights. All they'd have to do is sip a little bit of dragon's blood and their lineage is all but confirmed. The Holy See has known all of this, but held the information for centuries. Imeric will not allow this state of affairs to continue. He wants to raise this with the Archbishop. But what good will that do? They have kept it hidden for a reason. He will be bound in ironclads and called a heretic. If the Archbishop does that, then he will show motive. Imeric will do it for the future of Ishgard. It doesn't matter what the Holy See tries to do anyway. Yusail will share the news with her followers. The Holy See will not be able to stop its spread. The truth will come out in full view. If we want Ishgard to survive, it cannot be divided over such things. Is it wise to let Sir Eimerick leave like this? This is a form of idealism that Alfinoad thought Eimerick didn't have. Lucia remarks that even though Eimerick seems like a realist now, he was always an idealist. It was why she swore an oath with him. Instead of trying to stop him, we should think of ways to aid his cause. If Eimerick doesn't return within an appointed hour, Lucia will break into the vault and rescue him herself. It doesn't matter if this is treason. It doesn't matter if she is an enemy of Ishgard. She will take that risk. She isn't born of this land and is only loyal to Eimerick. However, if the rumors of his birth is true, then we shouldn't have anything to worry about. Seeing as we are outsiders, we ask what these rumors are. The rumors are that Sir Eimerick is the bastard son of the Archbishop. Men like the Bishop are not allowed to have children, or even wives, but it seems that not all men are able to resist temptation. It has never been public knowledge, but it has plagued him throughout his childhood. She hopes the burden of his birth will now work in his favor. Maybe the Archbishop won't execute his own flesh and blood. Estinian is of the same mind. He too will break into the vault and rescue him. Horshfont agrees. We need Eimerick. Horshfont is a knight, and the most important things to a knight is to serve, to protect, and to sacrifice. We also agree with everyone. We will fight to retrieve Eimerick if need be. We need to enlist more help if we want to open the vault. We notice that Tataru is nowhere to be found. We try to find her, and see that she's being chased away by two men. We follow them, and ask why do they chase her. 
They call us a highborn's master's dog, hoping to catch a whiff of heresy. A battle is about to break out, but an unknown voice comes to dismiss the battle. A woman with black hair and ruby-like eyes appears. She is known as Hilda. We move into the tavern, and Hilda pays the barkeep to close up shop so we can converse a little more privately. We tell her of what we know. We discovered secrets that the Holy See has been covering up for years, that the Lowborn and the Highborn are all descended from heroes of Eld. Sir Eimerick has gone to ask the Archbishop about that and is willing to be sacrificed to prove that point. But we cannot lose Eimerick. He is Ishgard's main defense. The reason we came to Hilda is that we want her aid in saving our friend and fighting our way into the vault. Just before she can give her answer, a bang is heard from upstairs, and Elizan is thrown from the top floor down to the bottom. Standing atop the stairway is Sir Charibert. He remarks that the honored guest of House Fortemps is conversing with the Queen of Rats. He notices that we are plotting something nefarious and means to stop us here. Hilda fires her firearm at him, but the bullets are reflected by his barrier. He again calls her a rat and tells us to come outside to confront him. We defeat Sir Charibert with the help of Alfinoad, Horshfont, and Hilda. Yuchia arrives on the scene. Charibert flees. Luckily, the battle ended now. It wasn't too long before an innocent bystander was caught in the crossfire. It was announced that Sir Eimerick was imprisoned over heresy, and the Heavensward have been granted full authority of the Temple Knights. Those that are loyal to Eimerick are on our side, but those that are against him gather at the vaults. Our attack is expected. Hilda is convinced by Alfinoad and agrees to join in the fight as long as it changes the way life is lived in Ishgard. Today is the day we march for the vault. We manage to fight our way into the vault. We defeat Temple Knights who are against Eimerick, along with Sir Adelfel, Grinoax, and Charabert. They seem to possess the ability to increase their powers several times over. It is reminiscent of the powers Yaseo has with Shiva. In the end, we arrive at the top of the vault. Sir Zephyrin calls for a retreat. We spot the ship pulling up at the other end of this walkway. We give what chase we can. Eimerick calls out to his father, the Archbishop, as he flees aboard the ship. Why does he flee? We do not need to keep this deception anymore. Nidhogg is dead. There is nothing left to hide. Let's start anew. He calls Eimerick a fool. What good is it to tear down the thousand years of society they've had? Horshfont and the Warrior of Light race towards the Archbishop in an attempt to stop them from fleeing. Without realizing, Sir Zephyrin begins gathering Aether and forms it into a lance. He then aims that lance right for us. We were caught completely unawares. Horshfart notices and pushes us aside to block the spear with his shield. There is a minor struggle, but the shield cannot hold this spear. The shield begins to crack and split. It gives in. The spear pierces right through the shield and into our friend. Blood spurts from his mouth and runs down his chin. He falls to the ground. Eimerick cries out to Horshfont. Everyone rushes to his aid. The Archbishop leaves for Aislea. Horshfont remarks that he couldn't bear the thought of that spear hitting us, ending our legacy. He reaches out his hand. We grasp it. We cannot bear to see our friend in this state. He asks us not to look at him like that. A smile better suits a hero. Then his head goes limp. His eyes roll back. Our friend is no more. How could we have been so foolish? How did we not notice the spear in time? How grave our mistake was. We just lost one of our brightest lights, who was there for us in our darkest hours. His death will be felt by many. We return back to House Fortemps 
and inform Edmund of his son's passing. We approach him as we want to comfort him in any way we can. He tells us not to. He is deeply hurt, but tries to convince himself it was for the best of Ishgard by repeating Horshfant's words that a knight must serve, protect, and sacrifice. There is no greater calling for a knight. He wants to be left alone to mourn. He wants us to give what chase we can to fight for his son and the nation he loved. Alfinoad is at a loss for words when confronted with the grieving father. All he can say is that we won't forget the sacrifice Horsefont did for us. Upon hearing this, Edmund breaks down into tears. A father is not meant to pass after his son. The pain he is feeling must be unimaginable. We gather ourselves and meet Sir Eimerick. His wounds are healing, but some wounds do not heal. We all look towards the ground. Suddenly we are given a vision. It shows Eimerick pleading his case to his father, Thordran. He is interested to know how he learned of this knowledge, but tells him that it is correct. King Thordran and his twelve knights trapped and butchered Radatoska so they may partake of her eyes and gain unimaginable strength. Learning of their treachery, Nidhogg was consumed with murderous, but justified rage. He slew the king and half of his knights, but lost both of his eyes in the process. However, in his last moments, they showed him mercy and allowed the dragon to live, but he received a new eye from Hraes Velgir and used that power to continue his rage to this day. One of the eyes are held by the Azure Dragoon at all times, to fight Nidhogg whenever he plagues us, but this second eye is still unknown. He asks Eimerick, will he answer for his sins? Will his son's son answer for his sins too? If man cannot atone for a sin in their short life, then will his progeny be held accountable too? What Thordran did was an unforgivable sin, but are we meant to just surrender ourselves to the dragons? No, he won't see the children of Ishgard sacrificed to appease a hungering foe. Dragons don't understand life. Human life is fleeting when compared to them. They believe that the wrongdoings of man happened as if it was yesterday, even though thousands of years have passed. Man have tried to atone for the sins, but they won't let them forget. He uses this as justification for why he does what he does. Eimerick calls it a lost cause, a death sentence. There is no end this way. Thordran believes that the people sacrificed their lives for the good of the country anyway, low and highborn alike. And what would you do? How do you tell the people who have lost a loved one that they died for no reason in a fool's war? Over thousands of years, there have been different archbishops. They have known the situation this entire time and every time deemed it not worth sharing. He tells Eimerick to not worry. He will set Ishgard free of its sins and bring about change. Eimerick is then arrested along with anyone he has conversed with. Honestly, a good point is brought up here. Both sides have completely outstanding arguments. You can understand why Eimerick wants to share this with the people, but you can also understand why the people are better left ignorant. We awake from our vision and tell him what we saw. Eimerick is embarrassed about the situation. When faced against his father's unwavering conviction, he could not find the words to fight back. But Alfinuad assures him that something a friend taught him a long time ago was to differentiate between words, deeds, and beliefs. And what his father was speaking was nothing more than self-serving delusions. That friend was Sir Eimerick himself. Alfinuad can't help but wonder what kind of change Thordran will bring about. During the battles with the Heaven's Ward, they were seen using weird abilities which changed their forms. They are Thordran and the Knights of Old, with their holy powers intact. They have the prayer and devotion of the people, and a whole lot of Aether. They are in fact invoking primal power, just like Yasael does with Shiva. Thordran has fled to Eyes Lear. We do not know where that is, or why he goes there, but we must put a stop to their plans.
We need to find out what Eyes Leah is. Instead of searching around for a pilot, we decide to ask Sid. Sid is quite cheery, but it seems he hadn't heard of Horshfant's passing. He states that Horshfant was a good man. We ask if he's heard of Eyes Leah before. He hasn't, but it sounds like a good source of a huge amount of power. If the Ashians are trying to tempt Thordran with power, like Ultima, then it could be in Eyes Leah that power remains. Sid notices how grave this endeavor may be and decides to take us there on the Enterprise. We enter the Enterprise and head for the northern reaches of the Sea of Clouds, where there is yet uncharted land. As we gaze upon the clouds, we have familiar words echo in our mind. For those we have lost, for those we can yet save, we try to turn our thoughts elsewhere, but are met with the memory of a broken shield. We need to find the mysterious land known as Eyes Leah. We do not know where to go, but decide to ask local beastmen if they have seen the Archbishop and the Heaven's Ward. We arrive at the home of the Zundu. They offer us aid and allow us to rest in their home. They have better hospitality than the Vundu. Just before we can settle in, we can hear cannon fire. Sid arrives and tells us that the Imperials have begun fighting Bismarck. Bismarck can be seen eating an entire island. Lonu Vanu calls the beast a devourer of worlds. We are told to speak with the chieftain, Sonu Vanu. He tells us that the Archbishop and the Heavens Ward are in fact here and are searching for the keys to the forbidden land, Aislea. Aislea is a birthplace of sin, a home of forbidden secrets. However, Bismarck devoured the island, which housed the key. Alfinawa doesn't want to leave the keys in the stomach of a primal and suggests that we go retrieve them. Our plan to defeat Bismarck is to strap an island to the Enterprise and use that to lure the beast to follow us. Then when he attempts to attack the island, we will hold him in place with ballistas. The plan goes smoothly and Bismarck is no more. Upon his defeat, we obtained the key to Eyes Leah. We have another vision. We are brought to our vision world, and the Crystal of Wind regains its original color. Out of nowhere, we finally hear Heidelin's voice, but it is not as clear as it was before. She warns us of an approaching darkness unlike no other, and tells us to receive more of her blessing. The vision ends there. We retrieve the key to Eyes Leah, but just as we leave, an Ashian, along with Thordran, block our path. The Ashian is known as Igeyorm. To remarks of our endless feats, how many times have we defeated a primal at this point? They are here to claim the key from us and take the Alagan secrets. She restrains us with Dark Aether, making us drop the key. Our blessing is weak, but has returned. Thordran thanks us for killing Bismarck and saving them the trouble of doing so. He raises the key of Eyes Leah towards the sky. It begins to open and creates a magical circle above it. This key then fires a beam in a direction, telling them where Eyes Leah is. The rest of the Heavens Ward arrive to pick them up and fly off into the distance. We return back to the Zundu and tell them of what happened, but something feels off. When we return, we see all of our Zundu friends captured by the Imperials. The leader of this little group is known as Regula Van Hydrus. He tells us to make our presence known. We walk out from the shadows to confront them. He asks who we are. A mysterious voice calls us the Warrior of Light and Alfinoad from the Science of the Seventh Dawn. As we look upon the man, our eyes widen and our jaws become ajar. The man in front of us is the current reigning leader of Garlemald, Emperor Varus Zos Galvus. We are all here for the same reason. We seek to enter Eyes Leah. Varus Zos Galvus thinks that we seek Eyes Leah for the same reason he does, to find the means to bind any primal to his will. We both agree that the primals are a plague on Eorzea, but disagree on the solution. Garlemald would commit genocide if it meant that the primals would stop coming. Varus replies that if the people must die, to bring the primals under control, then so be it. He orders the Imperials to surround the captured Zundu. 
the Imperials draw their weapons on our friends. They are given order to kill them. Alfinoad shouts that they aren't even tempered. Just before they are murdered in cold blood, we are aided by Lucia. She is riding a Magitek Reaper, not unlike the ones we have seen before. The Garleans call for their retreat. The beaming sun above us is suddenly blocked by a colossal shadow. We then look heavensward and spot it. It is the new Garlean flagship, just like the flagship they had before. It may even rival in size to the one before it. We retreat to the Enterprise. Wedge saw the beam from the key and calculated the exact direction the beam was going to. We begin to follow his directions and make our way towards Eyes Leah. Lucia remarks that she didn't believe that she would have to ride one of these again, referring to her Magitek Reaper. She removes her headpiece to reveal that she is in fact a Garlean. Her name is Lucia Goe Junis. Sid realizes why he almost called her Livia when he first saw her. She is the sister of Livia Sass Junis, one of Gaius's lieutenants who we slew in Castrum Meridianum. Even though they are related, they were separated on birth and raised in different homes. She was sent here as a spy and her main mission was to gain access to Eyes Leah. She did this task willingly till she met Sir Eimerick. She found herself drawn to him for more reasons than just her mission. Instead of cursing the fate of his birth, he rose above it and overcame it. After some time, she found a man worth following and had a home to boot. She confessed it all to Eimerick and he allowed her to stay at his side. Alfinoa doesn't question her loyalty to Eimerick but questions if she is loyal to her sister. She does not dwell on the past. Someone who stays in the past will not be able to move forward. Livia fought for what she thought was right and so do we. She died fighting for what she believes in, so Lucia doesn't hold anything against us killing her. Sid is happy to have another Garlean in our merry band of adventurers. We are getting close. Once we break past these clouds, we will be in Eyes Lear. We push through the endless amount of clouds and arrive in Eyes Lear. The skies change color from a bright light to a dark, yellow and rusty landscape. In the center lies a gigantic, elegant machine. There seems to be a barrier in the lands, which is stopping us from landing onto Eyes Lear. We shouldn't try and force our way in. The Enterprise is breaking. We must retreat back to Ishgard and figure out another way in. But at least we now know where Eyes Lear is. We have a meeting backing Ishgard to figure out how we can breach the Allegan Barrier. It uses Aether around it to create a wall of lightning, and without a key, you cannot pierce that wall. Even with all the experience we have in nullifying walls like this, this one is a bit different. The Enterprise is too small to hold such a quantity of crystals. Sid recommends that we should pierce the barrier rather than nullify it like we normally do. We can create a ram made of condensed Aether and mount it upon the ship. However, we do not know how to build it. We in fact need one of the Scions to do so. Edmont mentions that Tatari was in high spirits. She is close to locating one of our dear friends. We meet with Tataru and she tells us that she has in fact made progress in finding our friends. She asks Pippin Tarupin to conduct a search in the waterways beneath Oldar as that was the last place we saw the rest of the Scions. We arrive in Oldar and talk to Uriandra and Pippin. Within the waterways, the tunnels were collapsed. They found dozens of brass blades in Crystal Brave's bodies, but none of the Scion's bodies. All that remains is Yastola's wand. Uriandra uses his etheric goggles on her wand. The etheric imprint on the wand shows that she may have cast a spell that sent the Scions into the life stream. By tapping into the flow, you are able to send people away from where they currently are. It is an extremely old spell. It sounds like good news as the Scions did in fact escape. But there was a reason Charlayan disallowed anyone from using this spell. 
For every person that came out of this spell alive, others did not. Your Stoller may be stuck in the life stream. It is not all doom and gloom. Uriandra reassures us that if we follow the flow from where the spell was cast, we may be able to locate her. We go to where the spell was cast and follow the flow. Uriandra deducts that the flow trail leads to the Twelves Wood. We must make haste as the soul cannot last long within the restless currents of the life stream. We have a meet with Elder Seedseer Khan A. Senna and ask her to help us retrieve Yastola from the life stream. She has requested the help of the Elementals, but we must be aware of the differences between the Elementals and man. They perceive the world differently as a being made of pure aether. Normal people cannot communicate to the Elementals as words do not reach them. However, Seed Seers have the ability to communicate to Elementals through their feelings. Another problem is that we need a relative of Yastola's as the Elementals can only find her if there is someone with similar aether to hers. Tataru mentions that she has a sister who lives in Gridania. What a stroke of luck! We rush out to find her sister. We bring Yastola's sister, Yamithra, to Khan A. Senna. The Seed Seer siblings, Khan A. Senna, Rayo Senna, and Arun Senna, beseech the aid of the Elementals by using their feelings to communicate with them. Khan A. Senna asks them to find the drifting soul within the life stream. They begin channeling Aether. It is a bright, blinding light. After some time, the tree begins to glow. They look towards the one light they need and reach towards it. Another blinding light is seen. Our dear friend Yastola appears from it. They did it. They recovered her from the life stream, but she does not stir, not even once. Her sister rushes over. We follow after her, but are motion to stay back. They will bring her to a room in the roost. All that is left is to pray that she makes a full recovery. Our prayers have worked. Your Stoller is awake. We cannot contain our feelings. We are finally reunited with one of our dear friends. We notice that your Stoller's eyes are of a different color. Originally, they were a light teal, but are now a vacant gray. She mentions that she can sense the Aether around her differently since her visit in the livestream. Alfinoad asks if she's fit to talk. She states that she is. He asks her what befell the Scions after bringing the tunnel down. She channeled a spell to teleport Thangred away at the last moment. However, she found herself in the turmoil of the livestream. She asks, where is Minfilia and Thangred? We tell her that the first one we were able to find was her. Tataru has hope. We will find the rest of our friends and rebuild the Scions. She mentioned that she has taken up weaving and has prepared an outfit for Yastola. They shoo us out of the room while she changes. Yastola has her new outfit and they ask us to come over. Natara has caught her up to date with everything that happened after she found herself in the live stream. We need to make an etheric ram to pierce Eyes Lear's protective barrier. We had hoped that Yastola could create one, but she does not know how. However, she does know of someone who could. The leading figure in Aetheric research within Charleian, her former master, Matoya. We make our way to the Dravanian hinterlands where Matoya resides. It was once a city of Charleian that was abandoned in a max exodus of the people as they decided to move north and rejoin with the motherland. We come upon the main city. Yastola tells us the history of this place. During the sixth astral era, men from Charleian journeyed across the seas of Eorzea, seeking knowledge. When arriving at the shores of the Dravanian hinterlands, they set up camp. Over time, that camp prospered so much that it turned into one of Eorzea's greatest city-states. However, with the keepers gone, the city is just an empty husk of her former self. We are confronted by a band of goblins. Yastola assumes that they are thieves, but it is actually their home. Since the Charleans left, the goblins came here to claim this as their own. We did not come here to fight the goblins for this land. We only want to cross the river to the other side. The goblins allow us to rest in a place named Idleshire. After helping the goblins, we are granted citizenship within Idleshire. They aid us by clearing the path that was blocking the other exit. 
we can now travel on the other side of the Dravanian hinterlands, specifically towards Matoya's cave. We arrive but we find no cave. We cannot seem to find an entrance. Yashtola checks around and summarizes that this wall must be fake. She raises her hand towards the wall and it opens as if it were a door. Upon entering, Matoya tells us that it is rude to enter without knocking. We see Matoya, a frail hunched over old woman who is short in stature. Yashtola and Matoya reunite after quite some time. She looks towards Alfinoad and calls him Louis Soir's grandson. Apparently she and Louis Soir were always at each other's throat. They have been friends in Charleyan since they were young. She had known the twins since they were babies. She asks us why have we come to seek her. We tell her the issue we're having. She is familiar with the name Aislea. It was an island sent up by Alag before their fall. It is a research facility dedicated to controlling primals and dragons. The secrets of Aislea aren't meant to see the light of day. That is why we must make haste. The Ashians have their evil hands in Aislea. She agrees to aid us in creating the ram. Matoya was tasked to create an etheric converger some 50 years ago. It draws in aether and concentrates it to create a destructive force. In the end, before she could finish her research, the Forum, which is the main governing body of Charlian, no longer wanted the converger as they were afraid it would destroy themselves rather than their enemies. She didn't like how spineless they were and decided to seal away the knowledge. Alfinoad states that they may be different, but she and Louis Soir's minds are alike. We need to retrieve the tome from the forbidden section of the Great Library. Even though the city is abandoned, the library's defenses will still be active. We begin to make our way to the library, but before we leave, Matoya asks that Yashtola and Alfinoad stay behind. She needs help making new sentinels as we just destroyed the last pair, so it is only fair that they stay behind whilst we go explore the library. We make our way towards the Great Gubal Library. Just as Yashtola said, the defenses are still active within. We defeat the last remaining guardian and it causes us to have a vision. We awaken our vision world. The crystal of water regains its color and vigor. Then the vision ends. We grab the tome we need and bring it back to Matoya. She casts a spell on the tome, which changes the words to something Sid can understand. It is dangerous and requires an unimaginable amount of aether to create the converger. We do not have the white orosite or the aether siphon. Minfilia and Moen Breeder are gone. Alfinoad has a revelation. We can use the eye of Nidhogg. The Wyrum's eye has great amounts of aether. With the help of Astinian, we should be able to harness this power at will. We must return to Ishgard and discuss with Astinian and the others about our idea. Just before Yashtola leaves, Matoya asks her to wait. She asks, when did the light fade from her eyes? Yashtola replies that it was an after effect of the life stream teleportation magic she cast. Matoya sighs. That is why they are called forbidden spells. Yashtola doesn't regret what she did. It was to preserve the light of hope, but she still remarks that it did give her a once in a lifetime opportunity to walk among the Aether. However, Matoya states that to see by sensing Aether around her affects her life force. By using Aether to see, she is using more life force than normal. She thanks Matoya for her warning and leaves the cave. We return back to Ishgard. We give Sid the tome which contains the knowledge of the Aetheric Converger. It uses the same principle used to create the ram we need. We also tell Sid that we will be using Nidhogg's eye as an energy source for the ram. They have all the ingredients, they just need to put it together, and it should, in theory, all work. We return to Edmont for our final goodbyes. When Horshfont begged him to let us join the house, he called us Hope Incarnate. He did not understand the words his son was saying, but he can now see what he means. We are Hope, a shining beacon to guide Ishgard through the snowstorm. He gives us the broken shield of four temps, used by Horshfont in his final moments. It is ours to keep as a memento. If Horshfont were alive, he would have wanted to come along on this journey, so we will bring him along in spirit. 
Having said our final goodbyes, we are ready to embark on our mission to Aislea. Ishgard kept their borders shut until recently, but thanks to us, we have found new allies to help us. We should celebrate and be grateful for all that we have achieved. Estinian says that we speak like true outsiders. Ishgard cannot celebrate until the war is over. Only then can they celebrate. Yashtola didn't mean to offend. She mentions that Estinian should be careful. To draw upon the eye is quite dangerous. It still stirs with hatred till this very moment. If he isn't careful, then the eye will consume him. He said he would rather consume the eye itself than let it consume him. Uriandra arrives in Ishgard. He has tread across sand and snow to bring us white orosite. Where did he get this from? It was among Moenbrida's things. She was ever so resourceful and had a backup orosite just in case the first one failed. We will use this to avenge her by defeating the Ashians. Sid is ready. He has finished work on the Enterprise and has changed its name to the Excelsior. We all go on board. Edmund sees us off. He says that wherever we go, Horshfond's spirit goes with us. May his fury grant us strength. Imeric arrives with the others and tells us to return. The Excelsior makes its maiden flight and we leave Ishgard, heading straight for Aislea. And that is where we will end this part. Again, I apologize about the length. Generally, I do a recap here, but I think I'll only do the recaps at the beginning of the finale instead of doing it at the end of every part. As mentioned earlier, the next part will contain the finale of Heaven's War. If you made it this far, I thank you for watching. Just know that you are acknowledged and appreciated. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't give it a thumbs down, consider subscribing if you're interested in more content like this. May you ever walk in the light of the crystal.